But actually, if you look out into the world, what do you see? You see the unicorn achieve, you see the 0.01%, you see a limitless and improbable success stories all around us that are kind of normalized. That's normalized this moonshoot as something that's obtainable, when of course it's simply not obtainable. And I think that's also a problem that not only do we have these excessive expectations of conduct and manner um, and behavior, but also this kind of excessive expectation of what success looks like. Thomas Curran, I am thrilled to welcome you to The Better Podcast. Today, we are going to be talking about your new book, The Perfection Trap, Embracing the Power of Good Enough. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Stephanie. Looking forward to it. Yeah. So I, uh, when I was first approached um, by your team with this book and this topic, this is a topic of conversation and just a topic generally that we reference a lot, almost as a, hey, who are all my type A personalities? Where are all my, you know, perfectionists at? And I thought that it was uh, wonderful that a book and that there's actually a field of study around perfectionism uh, and how pervasive it is in our culture, in our thinking, and how it modifies our belief systems and our behavior. So uh, very happy to have you here. And maybe we can start our conversation with a definition of perfectionism. So um, for some people, this might be a review of, you know, it might be a, a comment on their entire personality, <laughs> like <laughs> such as myself, but I would love a more formal definition of what perfectionism is. Of course. So perfectionism is a form of deficit thinking, uh, basically a way of existing that says I'm not good enough or I'm not perfect enough. And in order to matter or feel valued or loved in the world, I need to be perfect. I need to hide and conceal and try to correct those imperfections um, and make sure that nobody sees any chink in the armory, so to speak. So it's a very uh, defensive type of personality characteristic and very different actually to some of the things it's often confused with like conscientiousness, meticulousness, diligence, and all the rest of it. They come from a very active, optimistic place of wanting to do better to wanting to improve perfectionism comes from almost the opposite place that, that that place of needing to repair and conceal and and that's a very useful starting point when we're trying to unpack perfectionism yeah and you had talked in the book and i was saying again in the pre-chat i wanted to make sure that we expanded on this idea that a lot of times when we think about perfectionism we think about our own as you as you were saying this deficit in thinking we're not good enough one of the things that you weave through the entire book is this idea that it is not just a personal obsession with perfection, but it's more it's it's more of a cultural uh, that we are orienting ourselves to an environment or to a culture uh, of perfectionism. And I would I was hoping that you might expand on that a little bit. How perfectionism uh, maybe and we'll talk about genetics and the hereditary, uh, you know, heritability, let's say, of perfectionism. But how can we look at this first from, you know, if it's nature versus nurture, how can we look at this from a nurture perspective? How is this an environmental or a cultural phenom? Yeah, I was really keen in the book to impress on people that everyone feels like this. Uh, perfectionism is a spectrum and some will feel a little bit more perfectionistic, some a little bit less, some, some in the middle. And, and what we're seeing is perfectionism moving upwards on that spectrum for everybody. That's to see the average for everyone is moving, which tells us something interesting about society, what's going on at a broader uh, level that, that's uh, more than just what's happening within us, that everybody is experiencing these tendencies and these pressures. And, and that really begs the question, well, why is that? And I think there's a curious symmetry between that deficit thinking that's at the root of perfectionism and a culture and a society and an economy that requires us to feel those things in order to consume, to keep working, producing, consuming, working, producing. These are the way this is essentially what the economy spins on. It requires growth and growth comes from uh, a sense that we need to do more, we need to have more, we need to be more, that kind of deficit place that at this moment in time, what we have, who we are, is not enough, and that there's something more, and something more, and something more, and this is kind of the way the world teaches us all the time, that there's a material project to every solution, that if we just want a certain standard of living, we need to keep working, working harder, doing more, and so that got me thinking, well, 
you know, are we, are, is perfectionism a cultural phenomenon? Is it something that really is everywhere and all around us? And the reason that we seem to radiate perfection, perfectionism more and more is because the world around us radiates perfection. And so that was really why the book and the latter part of the book was a sort of deep dive into, into that phenomenon and tried to unpack why it is that society makes us feel like this. And is there more of an individual susceptibility to becoming a perfectionist or having perfectionist like so are you saying that perfectionism everybody you know we all sort of exist on a spectrum and we mm. can sort of oscillate high or low let's say depending on nature or nurture but do we have is there maybe a uh, susceptibility to uh, any one individual to be more uh, to fall on that spectrum of more perfectionistic than maybe someone else absolutely so nobody has the same amount of perfectionism and there'll be differences from individual to individual and, and a lot of that those between person differences are due to genetics about 30 to 40 percent uh, to be exact um and so there's a strong heritable component to perfection just like there is by the way for all personality characteristics um but what's left over after that 30 to 40 percent is subtracted out of course is up for debate is up for explanation uh in the social world and around us and um, a lot of people look at parenting and parenting is certainly a factor in perfectionism, but I think we have to look a bit broader than parenting to understand where the perfectionism is coming from. And as I said just earlier there, that there are certainly forces in society and culture, um, particularly around consumption, advertising, social media, schools, colleges, the modern workplace. There's a lot of pressure to be perfect, to do more, to work harder. And all those pressures, I think, can be internalized as, as a need to be perfect. And that's perhaps what we're seeing in these rising levels of, uh, of perfectionism. Well, 30 to 40 percent. And are you saying that's across all personality traits? So not just perfectionism, but all sort of personality traits have in that range of 30 to 40 percent inheritability from mom and not dad? A, not all of them some are slightly higher um in fact most are around 50 percent in some cases so um you know very very strong genetic heritability of personality um and perhaps stronger than actually most people think um but it's also important to remember that that leave it still leaves a lot for the environment to explain so even though yeah. you might be genetically predisposed to perfectionism conscientiousness and neuroticism or whatever it might be um there are still forces outside you that can either turn the volume up on that neuroticism or or can turn the volume down right like the world we grew up into and come of age into can dramatically impact the extent to which those uh, inborn tendencies will, will impact on our lives um and this is the argument for perfectionism right you know, i'm a perfectionist consider myself to be a perfectionist person and um i explain in the book how that's probably come from my mother who's also a perfectionist too um but but the society I've grown up into, I think, has amplified those tendencies. And I think that's that's the same for everyone else. And so while I may be more of a perfectionist than perhaps another person, the the reason why is probably genetic. But nevertheless, that doesn't mean that all of us at some level, even if we're not genetically predisposed, are going to experience some difficulty of perfectionism because the world we live in amplifies perfectionistic ideals all the time. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting. I, I watched your Ted talk on it as well. And you were mentioning, you sort of opened by saying, Hey, this is our favorite flaw, you know, like in a, in a job interview, someone says, Hey, what's your best characteristic? What's your worst characteristic? And we all like to, you know, pause for a moment as if we're, you know, going into our mind mansion and then saying, you know what it is? I'm just a perfectionist as if that's, you know, a quote unquote bad thing, but we really do uh, as a society and as a culture, very much celebrate um, workaholics, right? So you see the workaholic who works however many, you know, the lawyer who's trying to make partners, working 80 hours, 100 hours, you know, whatever it is uh, per week, the doctor who is trying to, you know, climb his or her way up uh, the ranks in a hospital, also doing great, you know, surgeons, we know that they do just absolutely uh, abhorrent numbers uh, in terms of hours per week. We generally celebrate that we generally or you know in uh, you know i tend to be uh, very much in the you know as a chiropractor very much in the neuromuscular neuromusculoskeletal kind of nerd so i follow fitness very closely and when we see fitness competitors we admire them and say look at that work ethic you know it's so admirable 
And I think that there's a tremendous amount of suffering. Like there's a tremendous amount of trade-off that, that has to, inv- like that necessitates that kind of um, success. And in the book, you, uh, I'll just um, re- read a sentence if I may. Uh, you said, as far as I can tell, to move towards perfection is to alienate ourselves from ourselves or worse, to never find ourselves at all. Like that sentence just blew me away. I wondered if you might expand on that and maybe integrate, if you can, some of your observations and comments around why we celebrate, you know, quote unquote, if you're listening to this, I'm using my hands as air quotes now, you know, work ethic, you know, like what a great work ethic. Look at how he provides for his family or look at this Pinterest mom who has like the perfect birthdays and the perfect house and the, you know, everything is perfect all the time. Um, you even in the book talked about, I, I can't remember what terminal it was, it was a Heath, I think it was in Heathrow, uh, but this perfect, you know, these perfect advertisements, these men with the watches and the women with the perfectly, you know, coiffed hair, you know, why is that, um, wh- why is that something that we strive towards? Why is that something that we as a society just can- are so enamored with? Oh, goodness me, that is a big question to unpack, but I, I think at the root of it is a desire to continually move ourselves in a forward direction and not just ourselves, but our whole economy. And yet you, you have to remember that the economy really can't slow down and it certainly can't regress because that's a recession and we know what happens then. And in order for us to continually keep on this treadmill, I suppose this hamster wheel of more consumption and more work, we have to be held in a kind of holding pattern of deficit, of insecurity, of uncertainty. And that's done in all sorts of ways. But advertising is a principal culprit. So you'll see um, advertise a perfect lives and lifestyles, completely unattainable I- ideals to, to instill in you a sense that you're not good enough as you are. But with this product, you can get closer to this uh, amazing, you know, ideal of a perfect person or whatever it is. Um, and so that really instills in us all the time a sense that we're not good enough. Then you've got social media, which is just an extension of analog advertising, but we're the uh, we're the content creators. We're the, that, we're the product. <laughs> yeah, who, who, who we ourselves create a hall of mirrors of limitless lives and lifestyles of perfection into which targeted advertising um, really thrives. So we feel a lot of deficit in those spaces. Um, to we look around us and how difficult it is right now to get by in an economy that's secularly slowing. And this is why, by the way, you see, you you know, you're surrounded by people whose answer to that question of how you're doing is so busy because yes, they're projecting those uh, high standards, but also they have to be busy because that's the only way you're going to survive and get on in this economy right. that's narrowing and, and slowing. Uh, and this, you know, in order to gain a good standard, a good enough standard of living to afford a house for goodness sake, you need to be in that very narrow set of professions, tech, medicine, law, finance that you just mentioned. And if you're not in them, if you're a teacher, if you're a police officer, a firefighter, your wages have been stagnating now for decades and they're only going to fall further behind the rate of inflation, which is really high at the moment. And when you weigh up all of this, all of this that's happening right now in the world, all of these pressures to continually push ourselves forward, to excel into those really elite spaces, um, to feel like we're not good enough and have to constantly consume and work our way into a sense of happiness and contentment. Well, that's, I think, what's at the root of our desire and need um, to be perfect. And that quote in the book really was a distillation of that in my own life as to try to constantly find myself through all of these external activities like overwork, overachievement, overconsumption, continue trying to find some inner happiness and contentment for all of these things that are outside of me. And that's really what perfectionism is. It, it pulls us away from ourselves to try and be somebody else, somebody perfect. And as, as a consequence, never allows us to acknowledge and accept who we really are, the imperfect, flawed, exhaustible person that we really are. Uh, in chase of an, an unattainable ideal so i think you know this is where my thinking has really come down on and, and this is why i see perfectionism as more of a cultural phenomenon and what age do you start, start to see this integration of some of these cultural narratives because someone we, we're getting it from our parents right like our parents are saying we want you to be 
We want you to be happy. We want you to do well in school. Um, you know, maybe we want you to excel in sports, uh, have a large network of friends, like all of these sort of different, uh, we'll call them boxes to, ch- you know, boxes to tick off. Uh, at what age do we start seeing that, you know, maybe that's coming from the parents. I think that that's also implicit in our school system where we are ranked based on, you know, we're given grades. You know, I have uh, one, my one son uh, he's going into uh, grade eight this year. Um, he Now he's in number grades, so he's given percentages. My younger son is still, he's still getting numbers, uh, letters rather. So it's A's, B's, you know, C's, whatever. Um, so at what age do we start or is there any evidence for an age where we start integrating some of these cultural norms and how does that affect our performance, let's say in school? Because I know I've heard of, children fainting from exhaustion, you know, from these, you know, um, I I've read, I think the one book I I'm referring to is, I think it was called tiger mom or something. It was why, you know, women, uh, I can't remember. It might, it might've been Asian women. So I, I, I apologize if I'm misubscribed, you know, saying the wrong uh, culture here, but I believe it was why, uh, in, in Asian culture, for example, it's very, and this is all it like South Asian, all it's, there's a lot of pressure to do well in school. And I have many South Asian friends that are, you know, have to be a doctor or a lawyer. And if you're neither of those things, then you've basically failed your parents. Right. So can we, can we talk a little yeah. bit about kind of the age of maybe inception, if you will, in terms of when children start really taking on this, these cultural narratives, both from the home and from, from their schooling? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot of life course analysis on the development of personality more generally and the development of perfectionism specifically. It's those formative years, the sort of early adolescent years are really where a lot of these uh, tendencies start to crystallize. You obviously have an inbuilt predisposition, but they start to really uh, express themselves uh, clearly around sort of 12, 13, 14 into that um young critical developmental um phase and they don't stop there by the way uh, this is the interesting thing about perfectionism perfectionism actually is something that gets reinforced as we get older and as we go into the world um and certainly that was a case for me where i was always an anxious kid but coming from a working class background there wasn't those perfectionistic um pressures now there was consumerist pressures don't get me wrong and i felt very embarrassed when I hadn't, you know, when my consumption couldn't meet up, match up with other people's and my friends, that was a very embarrassing and shameful thing. But nevertheless, didn't have these intense schooling pressures, didn't have these intense achievement pressures. And that it was only when I elevated myself into a different world, sort of academic world, I guess you could call it upper middle class world, whatever you want to call it, where those pressures are very live. You feel them, you see them all around you. The competition is fierce. And that's when my perfectionism really started to impact on my life. So, you know, those tendencies were always bubbling there for me as I was growing up, but they really exploded in um, young adulthood. And so my, the answer to that question is really, it's different for everybody and what triggers our perfectionism to come to the surface and really impact on our lives can come at you know any time in our lives really but the formulation starts in that kind of early uh early adolescent stage around 12 13 14. yeah and it's interesting because you would think as a parent one of the things that you would most want in your child is to have a gifted child someone who's just blessed intellectually to be able to grasp all the concepts and all of that but what i Uh, have found in just having conversations with therapists and also having uh, children, uh, we'll say, on the gifted spectrum, is that they have this kind of all or nothing mentality because things, some things like math, so some of my children, math comes very easily, but writing, for example, like language is more difficult. They will completely avoid, like they don't want to try at, at getting better at language and English. They just want to do math and science because that's what's easy for them. And what's interesting is when you have, um, you know, parents might think, oh, if I could just, you know, if my child could just get math or they could just get, but I, I find that, and this may be intertwined with perfectionism a little bit, but this sort of gifted child syndrome is, you know, you have this very intelligent child, but then they have this all or nothing kind of attitude. And I see that all or nothing kind of attitude in a type A personality as well. So in that perfectionistic, that, you know, perfection tendency where it's like, if I'm, 
I'm not willing to suck at the beginning. Like I can't try a new skill. Like I can't play the, if I'm not not Mozart on day one, I'm not even going to try it. Um, have you noticed that clinically? Has that ever been studied? This I just call it sort of lay, as a layman, I sort of call it like this all or nothing mentality. And I'll often say, you know, the type A personality when faced with all or nothing, if they know they can't, can't guarantee all, they will choose nothing, right? They'll procrastinate. They'll say, forget it. I'm not interested in it. They'll avoid it at all costs. Is that something that you observe maybe in yourself or in research that you've looked at? Absolutely. This is a clear clear signature of a, of a perfectionist is is applying ourselves in, in directions that are comfortable or that we think fit with some kind of underlying competency and avoiding at all costs putting ourselves in situations where we're almost certainly going to struggle we're going to hit setbacks we're going to be uh, exposed um very possibly publicly uh this is the fear and so what you'll tend to see is perfectionists can actually paradoxically, because a lot of people associate perfectionism with that kind of diligence, meticulousness, time on task. But paradoxically, you actually see when they encounter setbacks, challenge, they actually withhold themselves, just as you said there, because essentially you can't fail at something you didn't try out, right? So it's like, okay, well, I, I'm going to protect my self-esteem here and take myself out of that situation because likely it's going to end in some kind of public setback failure and i'm going to apply my energies into this uh, activity where i know that my chances of success are a bit higher and and by the way that fear of failure is so fierce that the perfectionistic people will sabotage their chances of success just to avoid failure and and that really is is what one of the core reasons why we're not seeing very strong relationships between perfectionism and performance um in the literature uh, and that surprises a lot of people but it's not as surprising when you start to unpack this fear of failure that perfectionistic people carry around with them uh, because they, they can be very inefficient in their striving towards a high, a high chance of success, but it may be easier tasks and away from more challenging tasks that have you know, longer term uh, benefits in terms of performance, success, growth, learning, development, all those goodies, um, which, they, which they can recoil from. And I would imagine too that that would you know, as a, as an adult, whether you go into business for yourself and you're an entrepreneur or you're working for someone else, that is really going to stifle your performance, let's say, or your success at work, because you're not going to be the person at the meeting, let's say, who's going to come forward with a new creative idea, right? Or something in, I, I, I think, and I've, I've talked to my boys about this because I can sort of see, it's like, they got it from their mom. <laughs> they got they got that fatal flaw, that tragic flaw of perfectionism from their mom. I can see them uh, shirking away from things that are more difficult. And we can talk about strategies, but I have found what I've found to be very effective is talking about effort versus outcome. So focusing on the effort that they put in rather than like who wins, like they also play soccer competitively. So it's like, it doesn't matter who wins or loses is that you were the best that you, like you put in your best effort. That's all I care about. Um, you showed but, up. Yeah, you showed up. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of half, that's kind of half of it. And then there's some yeah. element of luck. The ball is going to have a bit of a weird curve and you know, whatever. Right. Um, but I, I also would, you know, coming back to this idea of culture, with that fear, that that overwhelming fear of failure and rejection, and that we have to sort of conceal every flaw, you know, all that, where you have, especially right now, I would say in social media particularly, a very, um, uh, a culture, let's say, that leans towards cancel culture, like you make one misstep, career's over, reputation's gone, you're doxxed, people are just talking about you in ways that you could never imagine that they would say to your face. Mm -hmm. um, I would imagine that that would also uh, encourage a perfectionist or someone with perfectionistic tendencies to stifle their creative expression, even just their, just their ability to speak their mind on you know, certain topics that can, that can be deemed controversial, right? Yeah. And spontaneity as well, uh, it, it it does rob us a little bit of that. I mean, I, I hear you, I, I, and I think for young people in particular, this is really a difficult um, terrain to navigate at the moment because we do live in a blame culture. There's always got to be something or someone to blame. 
And what we don't do enough, I don't think, is explain. Explain what's going on. What are the reasons behind that statement? What are the reasons behind that failure or that setback or that mistake or that slip up? You know, there's always an explanation, and and I think we're we're quick to blame. We're less um, we're less eager to explain, and that doesn't give people space to make mistakes. It doesn't give people space to fail or slip up, and we're constantly hyper aware about making sure that everything is done perfectly because of that. And it isn't just, you know, the culture that we live in that kind of expects flawlessness. But actually, if you look out into the world, what do you see? You see the unicorn achieve, you see the 0.01%, you see a limitless and improbable uh, success stories all around us that are kind of normalized. This normalized this moonshoot as something that's obtainable when of course it's simply not obtainable. And I think that's also a problem that not only do we have these excessive expectations of conduct and manner um, and behavior, but also this kind of excessive expectation of what success looks like. This, you know, w which is completely warped from all sense of reality. Um, Nassim Taleb did a really nice analysis, a recently mathematician. Uh, they basically found, if you wanna to get to the very top of any profession, use the example of sports, you got to be a six sigma into individual. That means you, you're a one in 1.4 million, right? To get to the top, to excel in any one profession, right? That's so unlikely, so improbable. Uh, most of us, about 70% of us are going to fall somewhere around the average. And there really shouldn't be any shame in being average, <laughs> in being flawed, in being fallible, and not quite making it to the very, very top. That doesn't mean you can't aspire. And it doesn't mean you can't set the goals to try to get there. But it does mean that if you don't quite get there, it's okay. You can accept that reality that, you know, this is just the way life is, didn't quite get there. And you can manage those expectations and accept and be satisfied with trying and putting yourself out there and showing up, right? Just just as you said. So, you know, I, I think we live in a world that celebrates excessive amounts of achievement that constantly comes down on, on us at the first moment of slip up or mistake. And those two things combined really pincer us from two directions. They make us, com you know, completely fearful of slipping up. But at the same time, they keep us in this this tyranny tyranny of should and could. But we should be this, we could be that. And these things are just not realistic, not possible um, for the average person. So, I think uh, I think that's why you know, as going back to culture here, but it, it, we do live in a world where perfection is really all around us. Yeah. And I think social media really does enhance that as well. You know, I think of some of the influencers, let's say that I've seen on Instagram that just have these very beautifully curated, um, you know, accounts and they're always somewhere beautiful. Their hair is always perfect. And I, I think, you know, I can, I can speak as a woman, you know, looking at these, you know, perfectly and very often modified photos, there's filters and there's body imaging apps that make you sort of bigger here, smaller here, et cetera, it really can do a number on your self-esteem. Like sometimes I even know when I'm in a bad mood, when I find myself on Instagram and I'm like, you know what I probably need? Maybe I need to do my lips. <laughs> you know? Maybe I need, maybe that'll make me feel better. Right. And then, you know, my, I'll sort of mention maybe a comment to my husband and he'll be like, are you crazy? What are you talking about? And then I'll catch myself and say, oh yeah, no, no, this is like the, in, this is the effect that Instagram can sometimes have on me where I'm like, gosh, you know what I, I, I what I probably, like I need, I need surgery. I need some kind of intervention to make me feel better. And you, you talk about, I'm using my own personal example as a way for, you know, you to sort of chuckle and for the listener to hopefully I'm not the only one that's ever <laughs> that way. But um, you talk about this Easterlin paradox, which is kind of this like, I, I believe if I'm, and I'll let you uh, explain it better than I can, but this idea of like status anxiety, right? That we don't measure up. So kind of just back to what you were saying around this very slim percentage of ever making it pro, let's say you play pro football player, pro NHL player, pro whatever. And you talk about this idea that it's not that we don't have enough money or stuff, but it's that we don't have enough money or stuff compared to other people, right? So these Instagram influencers that are always in, I don't know, Capri or Barcelona or somewhere beautiful, um, and we're kind of at home in our in our track pants, thinking that we need to, you know, 
inject our lips with, <laughs> with something in order to sort of, you know, emulate the happiness that they seem to, they seem to just have everywhere. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, of course. It's, I mean, it's expectations uh, versus reality. It's, and it's all around us. East, Eastland's paradox is essentially this um, explanation for a, a weak link between uh economic growth and happiness within a population and once you reach a certain threshold in gdp that's to say you become a developed economy there is a very weak if non-existent relationship between gdp and happiness so any additional um uh, increase in growth uh within an economy a development you might say doesn't doesn't uh, equate to more happiness and that's because within those economies there's very there's highly developed economies there's growth dependent economies it's not what you have that's important it's not the comfort the abundance that you have in this moment that's important but rather what you could have how you could live compared to the advertisement the social media feed or the just the person next door right it's all relative to the people in your social environment and your increasingly virtual environment to whom you are comparing yourself to that's what matters in terms of your levels of happiness and i think you know, again, this goes back, linking this back to perfectionism, not feeling good enough, not feeling like we're uh, uh, worth or we matter. These are these are things that occur in a social context, right? They're not they don't occur in an individual vacuum within us. And that's why perfectionism is a, a relational characteristic. Right? It's, it's how we relate to other people. It's how we interpret what other people say and do in ways that reinforce or bolster our self-esteem. And so when we live in a world that's highly comparative, that keeps pointing us in the direction of other people and what, what what more they have and how much less we have, then of course we're going to feel like we need to improve our lives in certain ways. We need to improve our lifestyles in certain ways. And we need to keep uh, doing that all the time. And of course, all of these improvements are necessarily in care cost, right? It's got to be a product or a material thing that improves it. We can't just go to the park or enjoy nature or sing right. and dance, dance with other people. Uh, it's always on the material end, but nevertheless, this is how we, this is in these developed economies. This is how we're, I guess, conditioned to think, um, comparing ourselves all the time. Uh, and that does, as I say, really impact on our, on our need to be perfect. And what about countries like Bhutan, which, by the way, we always do. Our podcast is in the top 10 in Bhutan all the time. They love us uh, in Bhutan where they have a happiness index. I think New Zealand is another country that has started looking at the happiness of its population in terms of metrics to track. So you mentioned, you, you know, you've sort of mentioned growth um, in terms of GDP, in terms of economic prosperity. But what are some metrics that we might be looking at either from a uh, sort of policy level but even more, you know, even if we, you know, if someone's listening is like, I don't care about the country, I just, I just want to be a little bit happier at the individual yeah. level. What are some metrics that we might think about uh, looking at or tracking as a measure of, let's say, happiness or prosperity that starts to move away from uh, consumerism? And um, is it, I forget the, is it, there is a term that you use in the book and it's escaping me now. Is it surplus society or is something Steady like- state. Yeah. So it was, it was like consumerism, yeah. basically, like all, we need yeah. to always consume more, the more bags you have, the more cars you have, the more things that you have, the sort of materialistic uh, consumerism that we are very much infected with in the West. I would say most Western countries, not yeah. all of them, but many of them have this kind of attitude. Well, well, first of all, hello to all your listeners in Bhutan. I hope yeah. you enjoyed the episode. <laughs> um, but there's nothing wrong with gro economic growth is actually so, so crucial, particularly in the early stages of economic development. And, and what happens in those early stages is that most people who are working to in, in, improve productive gains in productivity, that improve investment, that create jobs, that generate economic activity and, and, and provide a, uh, an increase in the standard of living for people within those economies uh, is crucial, crucial. However, there comes a point where the link between economic growth and uh, standard of living becomes weaker, starts to decline. And we're in that period now in many countries in the West where more economic growth does not equal more happiness, more contentment. And actually in the US right now, life expectancy is on the decline. Uh, living standards are on the decline. So what we're seeing is almost a reversal of that trend, uh, which is really interesting. When you're too pro when you're too prosperous, when when things are too prosperous, is that what you mean? 
Well, when you've reached a limit, right, that you mm -hmm. people in those economies can't keep being squeezed relentlessly without some kind of cost, right, right. cost okay. of their health, cost of their happiness, mm -hmm. um, cost of their life expectancy. Clearly, what's happening in, in the US right now, right? They can't, you can't continually grow. Like, it's an unsustainable, like, think about it like a tree. A tree doesn't continually grow forever indefinitely. At some point, it reaches a, a place of stasis, right, where it, it, it kind of its level, where it's grown enough. Uh, and it will stay there for many, many decades and uh, centuries. Sorry. And that's kind of like humans, too. You know, we, we have this early developmental period and then we reach a limit. Right? We reach a stasis where, where we've we've grown um, uh, biologically to the point at which, you know, at which no, we know there are no longer uh, any growth gains to be had. Um, and the same is true of the economies. You know, you can't continually indefinitely keep growing without some cost being occur incurred. And so what I'm, you know, Bhutan leads the way in this, but there are other countries that have decided, well, actually growth, meanly measured in units of products and services, is not the most optimal way to define progress within a society. And yes, you know, it's not to say that growth is a bad thing. There are certain areas of economy that require growth today, like, you know, renewable technologies, for instance, AI and the increase in productivity gains that we can we can get from uh, these very sophisticated and intelligent computer algorithms, if they're used, by the way, for the good of people rather than the value for shareholders. So there are areas of the economy that undoubtedly need to grow and jobs can be created and, and entrepreneurship and all that sort of stuff. But there are also areas of the economy that are damaging and extractive um, and that are creating more harm than good. And what Bhutan and other countries are saying is that actually, you know, let's try instead of having this fixation on growth. So in the aggregate, we just want all we care about is growth. What we should care about more is prosperity of people, health and happiness of people. Um, and so there are other um, things and metrics that are just as important as the economy as to whether we deem ourselves to be a prosperous state. And I think they, they lead the way really. I think this is really important uh, for us all that if we can, if we, if we, you know, not ditch our fixation entirely, but nevertheless have other uh, metrics that we use to determine whether um, our country is going in the right direction. And if it isn't, that we can we, we, we point policy towards addressing those things. Um, so like I say, Bhutan leads the way on that. And there are other countries that use happiness and well-being measures of metrics of success. And I think that's a really good, um, really good development. And then what are the, what are some of those metrics? Are they looking at body mass index? Are they looking at uh, do they survey their people? Uh, one of the things I'll, I'll say, I was just recently in Europe and we were in, we were in Paris and we were leaving Paris and we were, uh, we were flying to Estonia cause I was speaking, I was speaking there, um, at a conference. And while we were waiting for our flight and the gate to open and all of that, we were approached by a volunteer and he said, would you mind uh, filling out, it's like a two page, you know, back and, you know, double sided piece of paper about your experience in France, your experience in Paris specifically. And the questions were, you know, how much money did you spend? Let's say in the hotel, how long were you in Paris? Like some of these sort of, you know, they were looking just for data. And then it was, did you feel safe in Paris? Would you come back to Paris? Did you, what was your, what was your experience like in Paris? Would you tell others about it? And I, re I remember, uh, turning to Giovanni, my partner, and saying, this is such, I don't know how they're going to, I don't know how they're going to use this information, but this would be really awesome for every city, especially, you know, Paris is a very, you know, it's a major touristic center, a major city in the world, um, for them to understand how the participants who are visiting the city, how they experience it. But I think that this could also be maybe used in a way for like Bhutan, for example, like how are they, what are the metrics that they're using Hmm. to say what like that are comprised of this happiness index that they're that they're well, there's there's all sorts of subjective subjective measures that um people within those countries will answer a bit like a census if you can think about it like that yeah. um it's a kind of a check-in a yearly check-in on the status of people and look they're, they're imperfect measurements self-reported measurements of happiness are never going to be entirely 100 percent accurate but they do give a gauge and the more measures you have the bit the better the picture you can take about what's happening over time so they might ask you know how happy are you in this moment how content are you with your life circumstances how um satisfied are you with your community 
And there are other aspects in other uh, measures of uh, well-being and uh, happiness that talk about uh, attitudes towards race, attitudes towards immigrants, um, general societal values and attitudes that um, uh, are geared towards uh, um, how how much of a sense of community you have, et cetera, et cetera. So all these sort of very broad subjective metrics of contentment or I suppose satisfaction with our current life affairs, our communities and our happiness. These are the kind of measures that they take. And alongside that, you can ally these subjective measurements with more objective measurements. As I mentioned, life expectancy might be something that you throw into this metric. Um, you might look at um, investment in uh, infrastructure or number of people unemployed, uh, you know, all sorts of things. There are there are all sorts of ways in which you can measure like human prosperity, as to say, um, human well-being um, that go above and beyond uh, goods and services circling in an economy like GDP is measured by. So I think that's the direction those countries are taking. And I think it's a good one. Yeah. And I think there's, there's some, this is a little bit off topic, but I just wanted to mention it just for completion. I think that they also think about death a lot. And I don't mean that in like a dark, dismal, moody, but they contemplate their own death. They talk about death in a way that I think is not, not done in North American society. We are petrified of aging. We see our parents aging and we don't know what to do with them. We don't know if there's a grieving process. We ship them off often to uh, homes that can help better, you know, facilitate care for them. And yeah, we don't have a good relationship with death. And I think that when you start to think about death, uh, which I, I know that, um, uh, and, I, and I know this from a couple of different books that I've read, but they part of their culture is to actually think about death every day, which may also paradoxically, surprisingly, or not surprisingly, uh, add to their happiness um, because they're grateful for another day above ground, right? So, um, okay, let's let's move into let's move into how we can sort of break the cycle, how we can be the generational, <laughs> how we can break this generational cycle. Let's say of perfectionism. Uh, you talk. There's a couple of chapters that you dedicate. Uh, understanding that you're not a clinician, this is not clinical advice. You're not a doctor. Um, uh, but where can we start to break the cycle, let's say, of perfectionism? How can we get comfortable with just our, you know, the, the light side of ourselves, the side that we want to show on Instagram, and then the shadow side of ourselves? You know, the, the, for me, it's like the person in the pajamas with my hair in a bun, you know, in track pants <laughs> that doesn't want to talk to anyone. You know, how do we, how do we sort of fall in love with and maybe accept all of us um and what is what does breaking the cycle look like um from the data and the research that you've garnered okay so the first thing to say and this is uh, you're right i'm not a clinician and so i'm always a bit nervous like giving like uh advice around um how uh treatment or whatever what what my advice really is is focused on mainly is trying to build awareness number one of of why it is you feel like this one of the main motivations was to try to demystify some of the confusion that a lot of people have with where perfectionism comes from and that's powerful for two reasons one it helps us see more clearly our own inattentions and and why it is that we are um feeling the way we feel like in terms of not feeling good enough but two it takes tremendous personal responsibility from those beliefs and it gives a broader context to the way that we feel. And there's something remarkably comforting in the knowledge that this is a this these uh, tensions that we feel, these insufficiencies and deficit thoughts that we carry around with us are not our fault. They are there by design. And essentially, that's the, for me, that's a huge starting point in any uh, kind of rehabilitation from perfectionism, just to know just to know that these thoughts and feelings are normal, natural, inevitable living inside this culture. That's really important because if you if you don't start from that point and you start from the point of personal accountability, that's to say that this is your problem and your problem alone to fix, then when you find it hard to snap out of those feelings because you live inside a culture constantly making you feel that way, you wonder what's wrong with you and you go in on yourself and you blame yourself for not being able to snap out of it. So I think it's so, so important for us to understand first and foremost, as a broader context. And then within that reality, we can begin to work on those perfectionistic tendencies. And the, and the biggest thing that's helped me 
is to show up is to is to put ourselves out into the world little by little this you know there's no quick fix to this there's no life hack unfortunately sorry listeners but there isn't it's a journey and it takes a lot of patient perseverance but little steps out of your comfort zone every day showing more and more of yourself is so crucial goes back to what we're saying about perfectionistic people find it really difficult to do things if they don't think they're going to be world champion at it this is so important for us to challenge this is this is like taking a sledgehammer to perfectionism actually those things in your life that you really recoil from because you think you're going to show some frailty or flaw or imperfection a lot of people struggle with speaking for instance so they don't put their hand up to do talks at work a lot of people struggle with writing so they don't put their hand up all the time to write reports um, a lot of people struggle in social situations so they might recall sometimes for those social events within the office or outside what you struggle with uh sh showing up and showing yourself try to push yourself out of your comfort zone so put your hand up to do a talk maybe put your hand up to write that project report do it today do it tomorrow and go this is important go through the anxiety and discomfort that that's going to engender because it's going to engender a lot of anxiety and discomfort and, and reflect on that but in that moment of reflection ask yourself you're feeling these anxieties because you're worried about managing those impressions. Your perfectionism is telling you that if you screw up, you're going to show those imperfections to the world. So you have to at all times hold on to this perfect persona. But in those moments of discomfort, ask yourself, is that perfect person really worth living in fear for? Are they really worth living in fear about putting ourselves forward to do things that are out of our comfort zone? And the answer is no. But it's only when we go through the discomfort, it's only when we sit with the anxiety and let it into our lives and then go ahead and do it anyway, that we are able to realize that. Because often it's the case that we'll do a great job at a presentation or a report or whatever it might be. But even if we don't, even if we make mistakes, we don't quite get through, or the report was evaluated critically, whatever it might be, we can still understand and realize the impact of those things are not as catastrophic as what we made them out to be before we were reluctant to put ourselves forward and that there are opportunities to learn and there are opportunities to grow and there's something intimately humanizing about those setbacks about those failures, about those mistakes about those challenges and the more we can push ourselves out into the world the more we can get used to being uncomfortable in showing ourselves some of our true selves the easier it becomes and and trust me there is nothing more uncomfortable than trying to be somebody else going through the world trying to live and be someone else and there's nothing that gives you more spontaneity and joy actually than just being yourself and living with all of yourself and all of your feelings and all of your emotions and i and i think pushing ourselves out there is is a, such an important crucial way to do that and also when you do that you're going to encounter setbacks you're going to encounter difficulties you must make sure at all times within this kind of broad philosophy of learning to grow and getting out of your comfort zone to be compassionate to yourself at all times. So when you do encounter those challenges, don't go in on yourself. Don't berate yourself. Don't castigate yourself. Tell yourself it's okay. There's a bigger picture. Look how far you've come. Try to find the growth opportunities, learning opportunities, but at all times make sure that you treat yourself with kindness and you tell yourself there's always next time it's just one mistake of many mistakes that we're going to make every day and it's okay so self-compassion is really important showing ourselves and trying to accept ourselves as we are and meeting the world where it is too because the world is going to hit us with setbacks and challenges all the time things that we can't even control you know things that aren't even our fault like a global pandemic comes and screws everything up. Right. right we can't control that Right. So again, it's not just about acceptance of ourselves, showing ourselves, being compassionate to ourselves. It's also acceptance that the world is sometimes the imperfect world is going to create difficulties for us. And that's also OK. It, life is one big journey. It's going to be peaks and troughs and enjoy the ride. That's the most important thing. One of the games I've started playing with my kids is where's the lie? <laughs> so, uh, and I actually play this game with myself too, because I am completely susceptible to this. So I'll give you an example. So the last couple of weeks in the gym, I've made some really great, uh, some wonderful personal bests, you know, growing, I'm getting stronger, which is kind of a goal of mine, makes me very happy. Great. So today, uh, because I've had two weeks of like these great PRs, 
what do I, what's my thinking? Well, I'm going to get another PR today. So of course I'm exhausted because I've been working harder at the gym, go to the gym and I have what might be called like a five out of 10, you know, like I didn't have, didn't just didn't have the juice. It, you know, I couldn't, yeah. couldn't finish like the program that I had sort of written for myself. And there it was, it was like right there. It's like, Oh my God. And like, what is wrong with you? And you slept well and you did your supplements and you did all the things right. Like, why can't you just punch it out? Like just this berating, uh, voice. And I was like, Oh, there's the lie. You know, like the <laughs> lie is that the growth needs to be linear all the time because yep. in the gym and in life with public speaking, with soccer skills, with whatever skills you're trying to, you know, starting a new business, whatever it is, there's going to be, there's going to be moments of accelerated growth and then it's going to be flat. <laughs> and like yeah. the thing that you just have to keep, you know, it's just showing up and it's this effort versus outcome. Um, you know, this process versus outcome that I keep talking about with my boys that I'm, you know, I'm always telling them what's right. And, you know, forgetting to also like learn the lesson myself, but you know, it's like, here's the, like effort is the bit, like I showed up today. I did my workout. Yes. It wasn't my best. Yes. It's not going to you know be one for the books, but I still did it. And that's yeah. kind of amazing. And like, even though I didn't feel like it, even though, you know, whatever, whatever. So I think that, um, you know, to your point around having self-compassion, my version of that is like, where's the lie? Where's the lie here? Where's the, what's the lie I'm telling myself about yeah. what today should have been like versus what actually happened? And how can I show some, like, how can I just be, I would never speak the way that I speak to myself. I would never speak to my kids. I would never speak to a friend. I would never dare speak to any other human on the planet the way that I speak to myself. So I, whenever I hear that, I'm like, oh, there's the lie. There, the lie is right there telling me that I need to be perfect. I need to be punching out PBs, like personal best every single week. And I, the growth needs to be linear, which is of course, it, that, I mean, that's just hilarious when you think about it. Like who is, growth is never, nothing is linear. Nothing is linear, right? Absolutely. No, you, and meeting the world where it is is so, so important. And sometimes there is no explanation, right? Like, like you said, you go to the gym and your just body just doesn't give you, doesn't give you it back. I just, I, I have the same, I'm a cyclist. Sometimes my legs just aren't good and you can't explain it. You don't know why, but they just aren't. And it's, you can push yourself and push yourself and push yourself to complete exhaustion and make yourself feel miserable. Or you can accept that that's just the way life is sometimes, yeah. you know, and, and it's not always going to be, it's not always going to be a uh, PB day and that's okay. Yeah. Can you speak, you know what I loved about, um, towards the end of the book, you talked about your opinion after writing the book on growth mindset. And I would love for you to just expand on this a little bit, because I think that, you know, we've had seminal books, Carol Dweck's book on growth mindset and this idea of growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And, you know, individuals who have a fixed mindset, maybe those we might have ca characterized them as more, you know, perfectionist like tendencies. Like we think EQ and IQ and skills are sort of, you know, uh, innately given to you. If you have it, you have it. If you don't, you don't, but there's also kind of a, can we say loophole for perfectionists to pretend that being in a growth mindset Again, it's the same thing. Like I need to be getting personal best every week and that's growth and that's expansion and then it has to be happening all the time. Can you expand a little bit on uh, sort of how your opinion has shifted, if at all, on growth mindset after writing the book? Yeah, it's like anything, you know, in moderation, fine, but taken to extremes can be problematic. And it's the same for growth mind. Like, you know, I, I don't think Carol Dweck... In, uh, intended for this to happen but her growth mindset can has congealed these days into something of a cliche mm -hmm. and it's been picked up by people to push a narrative which basically says keep going keep moving never stop fail keep, forward fast fail forward fail fast fail bad right mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which you know is is fine to a point but the problem is but the more growth and more growth and more growth and more growth and more growth is going to push us into the arms of perfectionism because essentially what it's telling us is that our capacity to grow is infinite. We, you know, there's a limitless uh, potential uh, within us to do whatever we want, be whatever we want, have ever, everything we want. By the way, it goes back to this symmetry between the economy. This is how the economy grows. And this is how individuals too are taught that we should grow. But we are not, you know, our capacities and resources are not limitless. We are exhaustible, fallible, imperfect creatures. And sometimes 
we won't grow sometimes we'll regress sometimes as you mentioned we will stand still and that's okay and sometimes there's nothing to learn there's you know we we might go in a situation just as you're talking about there going to the gym and your body for some reason on that day just doesn't give you it back there's nothing you can do about that there's nothing you can really learn from that that's just a bad day at the office that's just sometimes it just happens we can't learn there's nothing to learn there's nothing to grow from and if we insistently put pressure on ourselves to do more be more to encounter these situations and try somehow to push ourselves even harder often by the way at the detriment of our health you know you take the exercise example that's a really good example like, you know body's not giving us it back today so tomorrow i'm going to overcompensate but working even harder well that's actually going to do us more harm than good because that overcompensation is going to um, fatigue and damage uh, muscles in ways which create worse performance, not better. And, and so, you know, this incessant focus on growth, growth. And by the way, I don't think this is what Carol envisaged. I actually have to say, I don't think this is what Dweck meant, but this is how it's now being interpreted in modern culture. And you hear about growth and growth mindset all the time, no matter wherever you look, social media, television, all the rest of it. Um, I think taken to an extreme as, as we seemingly are right now, it can certainly lead to perfectionism. Uh, but it's like anything, you know, moderation, growth mindset, no problem. And way better than fixed mindset, absolutely. Focus on the growth development of abilities. This is a very good thing. But we just need to be careful that we don't make it the be all and end all of everything that we do. Yeah. Well, I think that this book, I mean, certainly I can say reading it, I saw a lot of myself in some of the stories um, that you had uh, sprinkled through with a lot of the signs. This is a great book. I think it's going to help many of my audience. My audience tends to be a, you know, I could call, you know, I, I call my my audience, my listeners, my Bettys, you know, they're 40 something uh, Bettys who are kind of looking for solutions to mindset, hormone, hormones, like how their bodies are changing. And there's that adherence to like, what is now, you know, my life, my metabolic capacity, my body composition in my forties and fifties is not what it once was. So how can I like tighten the straps, pull, you know, make things tighter so I can kind of go back in time. And I think that this is going to be a really useful book in terms of uh, reframing our belief structures, of course, and, you know, as a psychologist, you very well know this, like, you know, uh, 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 our belief structures, of course, dictate our behaviors and the way that we think and our internal narrative. So thank you so much for writing this book. Um, it's available. Uh, we are actually recording this on the release date of your book. Uh, it's coming. We're going to be releasing this in a, in a week or two um, after this recording. But tell people where they can find the book and where they can find you, if, if at all, online or if you have an online presence, anything like that. Uh, yes, so my book is called The Perfection Trap. Uh, you can find it all good uh, retail and online outlets. Uh, if you Google Thomas Curran, uh, I come up. So there's a website and some social media channels there, LinkedIn and Twitter. So you can connect with me too. And I'd love to know if you do buy the book and read it. I'd love to get your feedback. So please do feel free to reach out. Don't be scared. Um, and to all the all the Bettys out there, uh, you're smashing it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so uh so thank you for listening and uh i if you if you do if you do buy the book i hope you enjoy it thank you so much